Good evening. My name is Peter Field. I'm a former suicide. I'm a survivor of the San Francisco Suicide Club and the San Francisco Cacophony Society. Participated to my eternal regret in some university events. Managed to survive it. I'm going to retire in four months, and I'm still living in the same apartment I'd moved into in 1986 in San Francisco. Yes. <laughs> And I work with homeless people as a, as a mental health case manager, which is what I've done most of my life in San Francisco. But tonight I've asked John and Carrie to let me introduce them and their topic here because in my avocation is I'm a San Francisco neighborhood historian. And I wanted to put what they're introducing you tonight in its historical context. Um, that may sound highfalutin and a little snobbish, but it's actually true in terms of San Francisco neighborhood history. The San University and the San Francisco Suicide Club started here in the Sunset District when there was a small colony of oddballs, I speak mainly of myself, living in the inner sunset in the 1970s. And we met each other out at Gary Warren's Circus of the Soul bookstore on uh, Judah between 9th and 10th Avenue uh, back in those old days. And one night, uh, John, uh, Gary Warren, whose bookstore it was, help me out here, John, Adrian Burke, Adrian Burke. and... For starting the Suicide Club? Yes. I wasn't there. Okay. Uh, David Warren, Adrian Burke, Thank Andrew you. Prussia, and uh, Gary Warren. And Gary Warren. We're sitting around one and night Gary at the bookstore. Go, but she didn't make it because she was ill that night. So she always said she was the fifth wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So they were sitting around one night in the store, kind of bored, and the weather was nasty, and it was kind of windy and blowy and a little rainy and stuff, and, you know, what the hell do you do? The store's closing. Where the hell do we go? So they decided, wouldn't it be cool to have an adventure? And they decided to go out to the uh, big uh, old, um, I'm having a senior Fort second, Point. Fort Point, Fort Point, that big <laughs> mass of brick in, from the Civil War and stand in front of the chains looking over the bay and stand there and let the giant waves break over their heads and see how that worked. And that's what they did that night, and they had such a good time doing it that when they got back and were warmed up with coffee and other uh, things, um, decided, we want to do more of this, let's form our own club. Gary, who was, uh, who was the most literate of the bunch, he owned a bookstore for God's sake, um, uh, came up with the idea of naming it the Suicide Club after Robert Louis Stevenson's short story of the same name, and that's how the Suicide Club started going. Gary had started the bookstore in the Sunset, being a San Francisco state unit, say a state uh, student, which is also a sort of in the Sunset District, and had started his own free university back in the late 60s and early 70s when those kinds of things were popular. Um, and Kim University was one of the looser versions of that dynamic where people were doing all sorts of interesting things ranging from serious discussions of philosophy all the way to one night when I did a class in which people were supposed to come up and do anything they were afraid to do with the support of a group. And among other things, we ended up in a, a saloon on uh, Irving Street because two, pe two guys in the group were afraid to meet women in a bar by themselves. So we all went into a bar to meet women uh, by ourselves. And these two met two women. Guess what the women told them? They were there on assignment from their group therapy to learn to meet men in bars. <laughs> San Francisco in the 70s. San Francisco in the 70s. So the Suicide Club had several good years of people doing urban adventures, things like, oh, climbing uh, bridges at night, um, infiltrating uh, the Moonies, uh, pie fights, um, locking yourself in a room all night to see if you and another group of people can agree with each other. All sorts of, all sorts of challenging, fun, adventurous types of things. The Suicide Club eventually went the way that most uh, social clubs go, and eventually out of that chaos and detritus came the Cacophony Society when five members of the old Cacophony Society got together. We're all arguing about it to this day. There, there you go. Four and eight, depending on who's on There you go decided to get together and let's start this over again. 
And so they did. It was a wiser, gentler sort of suicide club in which people were now drinking instead of being abstinent, were hanging out in bars with each other instead of socializing in people's houses because nobody had any money. And, the, uh, and we, we had a somewhat more organized and nicer and more scheduled newsletter than we used to have in the suicide club. And it lasted for another several years and made quite a name for itself in the Bay Area. Um, but all of this stuff was happening and started here in the Sunset District, which is why we're here in the uh, library tonight to appreciate this. As you pro probably have figured out, a number of old Suicide Club members are here tonight. And if you have any questions, they'll doubtless be, be happy to answer your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you John Law and Carrie Galbraith who are doing this tonight. <laughs> compilation that uh, a, a filmmaker, Olivier Bonin, uh, uh, did um, and uh, was put together for the, uh, around the time of the premiere of this book, which Carrie Galbraith, who's coming up here right now, and Kevin Evans, uh, and I put together uh, starting, I don't know, God, when did we start on this? When did we start on this, Carrie? About 2010. Okay. And we're, we're being recorded, so we want to speak right into this. Thing, oh, okay. So. So yeah, we started working on this in 2010. It took about three years to write it. And um, so we tried to cover the history, like a 34-year history in, in, in this book. And it's, it weighs, I don't know, like two, two and a half, three pounds. And, you know, yeah, three, you, three, point, three pounds, six ounces. Three pounds, six ounces. And you know it's a dangerous book because you could kill somebody with it by punching them in the throat with it. <laughs> um, but w w when we started putting the book together, um, we didn't want to... Uh, tell our personal stories. We wanted to do the best pot we could to tell kind of, a, you know, as objective as we could, the story of this group, the groups that came out of, a little bit of the history, where it came from, and uh, where these act, these kind of, how do we, all these different people do all this shit, you know? I mean, it's, how, how, did, how did it come about? It didn't just start from one person. It didn't start from one group. I mean, it was inspired by a bunch of different mm -hmm. things. And it start, uh, the, uh, really starting in the Inner Sunset neighborhood, um, and thanks to Robin and the Inner Sunset Library for asking us to be here. But, um, the, you know, the Suicide Club was a group that came out of, I guess we could start going through some uh, photos. And, uh, I, you know, we're going to go on Cacophony first, so let's see this thing. Yeah, here we go. So you want to you wanna talk about the slides that we're going through, <coughs> Ethel? Uh, Ethel yeah. Ketone. Ethel Ketone, which was uh, the name that Carrie used and still uses occasionally for Cacophony and other illegal activities. Um, it's actually the best pseudonym you could ever find in your life. I, I picked it up during the punk era when I was Ethel Ketone and the Methyl Esters. It was my fake band. <laughs> and I'd make fake band flyers and put them up all around the mission when I lived out at the old Sears building. And um, even now, if you, if you Google Ethel Ketone, you'll get 25,000 pages of chemistry before anything comes up with me. <laughs> so it was like the greatest idea that I didn't even plan. Yeah. So, oh, okay. um, first, go ahead. This the is first slides that we put in, I put in were like all just weird stuff that happened in San Francisco. So this is a St. Stupid's Day Parade. Bishop Joy had been going on for 34 years, only in San Francisco event. Um, it happens down in the financial district, and it's there to celebrate the uh, stupidity, the, you know, the one common denominator of all humankind, which is stupidity. Um, critical mass started in San Francisco. You probably know what that is. Uh, some of you either love it or are annoyed by it, probably both. Um, Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, which there's a lot of crossover with the Cacophony Society with this group. Um, uh, uh, Sisters Kitty and Sister Dana edited the Cacophony newsletter. Uh, Briefly, yeah. Met, yeah. Um, Lit Quake started here. Uh, I mean, what other town would you, you know, like start drinking in bars, you know, and like talking about books, and then all of a sudden there are like another 10,000 people doing it with you? Um, you know, Punk Rocker ran for, ran for mayor uh, and got 14,000 votes. Hey, I um, voted for him. Yeah, you know. and uh, V Vale on the left there with William Burroughs. Vale started research publishing here with a $100 uh, grant from uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti and another $100 from Allen Ginsberg, and he started one of the most amazing underground publishing endeavors in the country, Search and Destroy, which turned into research books. Um, Pranks book, uh, Robin Crabble's got a, a Pranks 2 book in the back, which has a lot of Suicide Club uh, cacophony And Cacophony, stuff in, and cacophony. yeah. yeah. Um, Survival Research Labs, Machine Art Group, we don't have time to go into, but they started here in San Francisco. Basically the most amazing machine art ensemble in history. Uh, not in the Inner Sunset, but they did start in the, uh, they started in the Mission uh, uh, Bayview. Church of the Subgenius didn't start here, but one of its main contingents was here. Uh, 
And uh, you may or may not know what they are, but you, you should know they're another wonderful religion. People have a tendency to want to start religions. I don't know what it is about that. <laughs> um, uh, the hippies were here before us, uh, and uh, some of them were pretty cool, and some of them were full of shit, just like anything. Uh, the Coquettes were a wonderful group, and there's a crossover from the Coquettes to the Suicide Club, Louis Brill. Uh, was taught who's in the suicide club. Um, I don't see him here tonight, unfortunately, but he was the uh, tumbling instructor for the Coquettes, or for the uh, Angels of Light, which is a theatrical troupe that was made up of Coquettes in the mid 70s. Um, Winston Smith, a friend of ours who's a cacophonist, you can talk about Winston, maybe some of you. Well, if he did all the album covers for the Dead Kennedys. He also did our uh, fly leaves for our book. When, when he got very involved, he's one of my best friends, and he got very involved in the Cacophony Society for a while. And the McDonald's event was, was his, too, wasn't it? Winston? Wasn't You know, he has great ideas. He never really oh, gets the them executed. Oh, the, the food fight at McDonald's? or No, the, the robotic. No, no, huh? But, uh, he might have been down there for that. But he's got great ideas. Yeah. Brilliant ideas. <laughs> so. And his, his artwork's kind of similar in a lot of ways to the events in Cacophony and the Suicide Club. He did and a lot of um, art for the Rough Draft newsletters. Um, Ant Farm was a group that was here a little bit before us and had a big influence on, on Gary Warren and the Suicide Club. Um, that's a few years later. Uh, a media Burn, which is right. a wonderful event that they did, which we tried to recreate many years later. Um, yeah. Um, uh, John Gilmore and John Perry Barlow, with the, who started the Electronic Frontier Foundation, both were in the Suicide Club briefly, um, and then went on to do some fairly interesting, important things to fight the government on encryption issues. Um, Brewster Kale, who uh, started the Internet uh, Archives, was a big cacophony fan. His wife, Mary, big cacophony fans, and they were the first people married at Burning Man the second year we were on the desert. Um, the uh, 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 Negative Land group, which was con concurrent with uh, a lot of stuff that we were doing, um, real instrumental in uh, sound mixing, hugely uh, influential group. Um, and uh, just trying to set the context, like San just, all this shit happened in San Francisco, or, or Oakland, Berkeley, but mostly in San Francisco. So now uh, we're going to go into some of the cacophony stuff. Okay. And, uh, you know. And <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and th this is the work of Kevin Evans, and the whole thing about this book, the, I remember John and I talked in the mid to late 90s about doing a book about cacophony, and John kind of looked at me and we both said, no, it's too soon. And then in 2010 or 2011, Kevin had done this art, and he showed it to a group of people who came over to his house, and that was it. I was like, I'm on board, I'm, I'm there. I'll design it, I'll do anything I have to do to be a part of it. So I ended up working on you know, this with Kevin and John. and Sebastian you know. Hyde helped out, Dean Gustafson. There are P. Siegel a lot of wrote a lot of, P. Siegel's here wrote a lot of stuff for the, uh, for the book. Um, Peter Field contributed a lot of photographs. Yeah, um, it was a joint effort. Oh yeah. Hugely joint effort. So, uh -huh. these, so there's 46 of these factoids and the idea was to play off of um, Ripley's Believe It or Not, and Kevin did 46 of these, and they're, they're interspersed throughout the book. I would just like to say the book's not for sale now. It's out of Sold print. Sold out. So, there, I, yes, I'm actually trying to find the publisher for a second edition. Perry? Yeah. Uh, you can, most, most often, you can find copies in the San Francisco history section of Green Apple. Okay. Yeah, they, we did like 12 copies for Green the Apple. Publishers the publishers out. The bookstores but, may still have some, yeah. Yeah, a few of the bookstores had like 10 or 12 yeah. copies, and they might not be sold out. But um, I'm looking at publishers to do a second edition that's a trade paperback. And since I know publishing better than most people, because I've been doing it for 30 years, I, I'm going to make a proposal to a bigger publisher with more distribution. Because right now, this book costs more to mail to Europe than it ways. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. a $40 book, a $40 list price book, which is a lot, it, but it's it, a It's 40 bucks for the book, but it'll cost you, you know, $50 to mail it to, you know, your friend in <laughs> Right, the which UK. is too bad. So, you know, so we'd like to see it in a trade paperback. Yeah. So if any of you work for Harcourt Brace or uh, Random House, please Noth. let us know. <laughs> um, uh, and then the, the rough drafts. 
Which yeah, rough draft was something that um, actually uh, these are probably Louise's art. Oh yeah, right. Louise is in here. Yeah, Louise Darmelo, right a here. Major part of the rough draft, and also a founder of Cacophony. I'd like to point that out. Um, it was the newsletter that came out every month, and you could subscribe, or you could pick it up at a cafe. I subscribed when I first picked my first one up. I think I sent a note in that said, hey, Ruff, how about a draft? And I put, and I put my $5 in it, you know? So it was, um, and it was also, and I'd just like to point out on the left here, um, it was, I was already, by the time I found Cacophony Society, I was already a Mac user, pretty hardcore, like making money off of working with Macs in 1986. And one of the other people doing the editing, who's now uh, the, he's the head of acquisitions at the at Bancroft Library, he was also a Mac user. So this, a lot of what we did for the, for the early rough drafts was all done on computer, which at the time, in 1986, 87, 88, was kind of pretty new. <laughs> so, along, yeah, thing. this is from the first Atomic Cafe, where we took over a bunker in um, the Presidio. We put our own locks on it and cleaned it up and painted in it. And then we, it was still military. The Presidio was still military. And we sort of snuck everybody in for a whole night of party as if you were a bunker culture. The idea was that you were a bunker culture, that you lived in bunkers and you got together like once a year to and trade. survive the Holocaust. To trade or, we, you know. And so that was what this, this, all these people got snuck in. Literally, the bunker was across the street from military intelligence. <laughs> so, still occupied building. Yeah, now. which, yeah, the military was still there. So this is part of what we were doing. See, yeah, there's, there's Louise. Carol, uh, Carrie, Louise, Annie Coulter. Um, Michael Michael. Michael Michael. And, uh, yeah, it's just a group of people. Yeah. But anyway, we can move on. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate. So you all have heard of Food Not Bombs, right? <laughs> this is another thing. Uh, actually, one of the uh, Suicide Club members, Jason Wechter, used to get dressed up uh, as, as a uh, rabbit on Easter. And we'd go into Golden Gate Park Suicide Club event and hand out carrots to kids and harangue their parents for giving them chocolate bunnies or Jason, Jason would in his Brooklyn accent, like, hey, kid, have a carrot. The chocolate bunnies your parents are giving are any good for you. Have a carrot. He's shoving it in the kid's face. Um, uh, Louise Jarmilowitz, um, who was a uh, major organizer in the Suicide Club and later Cacophony. But yeah, she still lives right there in that apartment, uh, 243 Lincoln Way. You, you probably still have oh. that outfit. I do. That was yeah. scary. Uh, a Gary Warren's clown outfit. Uh, okay. Yeah, and also this is a very informal talk, so if you want to yell at us, throw something, or inter interject something, please feel free. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna get mad. Oh, the zone trip. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I don't think it's such an original idea, but people seem to think it is. I don't know, but. Um, Her idea. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm this huge Eastern European and former Soviet film fanatic. I mean, I'm a walking dictionary, basically. And um, was many, many years ago as well. And before, you know, now I see people talk about Tarkovsky all the time. Well, in those days, there'd be like six people in the, at the Red Vic for one of his movies. And I would drive hundreds of miles to see a movie I hadn't seen of his yet. He made six movies. So, you know, I would drive 200 miles to see his, his student films. So I was this huge fanatic. And this particular film is all about going into this roped off, cordoned off zone where all rules and all bets are off. And I thought it would be a great translation to do this for Cacophony because I was by then pretty comfortable with doing a lot of Cacophony events. And... Um, so it, it was just something that I tried to, I also read the book this was based on by the Strugatsky brothers. And um, it's called Roadside Picnic. If you ever get a chance, they might have it here at the library, I don't know. But um, it's just between all of that and kind of the idea of the zone, I just started thinking, well, we can leave San Francisco and go somewhere else and all bets are off the minute we cross over the line. 
It's like a psychic kind of uh, barrier that you literally get together in a group and agree to cross into this zone where you would feel that anything was possible. Um, so. Yeah, so it just kind of took on a life of its own. Anybody could be a stalker and take people to the zone. Zone trips went to Mexico. They went to LA. They went all over the place. They ended up going to lots of different cities. Steve, there's a chair right here in front if you want. Um, <laughs> So that was, um, and if you ever get a chance to see Stalker, now there's a new print that just got struck. So, um, you know. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So this was part of a zone trip. As a matter of fact, uh, that was the first one or the second one to LA to, that, uh, to Southern Cal. Second one, because Steve was there, and Steve, it was Steve's idea to go to the Camera Obscura. This fellow right here. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we've managed to get in it, and then we watched, I remember we watched on the, the para, parabolic. parabolic. <laughs> yeah, we watched a drug deal happening in the, in the, <laughs> across the street in the parking lot. That was fun. That was actually pretty funny. <laughs> so this is part of the one of the first few zone trips. Yeah, this is on the roof of the Million Dollar Movie Building in downtown Los Angeles, which is across the street from the Bradbury Building. Both buildings were used uh, as sets for the movie Blade Runner, and this building was 90% unoccupied at the time that we went. We snuck into it and were mm -hmm. creeping around in it. And we went into the offices of Harry M. Popkin uh, Productions, which is a film office uh, from the 50s, a B-movie film producer. It was completely abandoned. It's like they just walked away, leaving the doors open with all the movie posters, photographs, all the correspondence lying on the floor, the windows open. And Harry Popkin was known for producing the movie DOA, which is set partially in San Francisco. Just a little aside The original there. one, yeah. yeah. Um, this was actually right around the corner from where I grew up. Um, <laughs> There, there was another Cacophony member who I believe was part of the Suicide Club, and the reason we ended up going to this zone first is because we found out that we were both from this town in L.A. And I just um, would like to mention Phil Buley because I miss him every day. Yeah, He's Phil been gone Buley. for a while. So. Well, dear friend of ours, you passed away a few years back. Yeah. Um, but this was right, literally right around the corner. The Watts Towers, there's, there's Phil. Phil. Right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we went there on Sunday morning. I remember going to the Watts Towers on Sunday morning because we thought it would be the safest time to go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the, with the zone trip in L.A., we had all been, and, and we had not, not all of us had been to L.A. Some of us hadn't been there. Others uh, uh, had never been there, had only seen it in the movies. Other people grew up there. But it, while we were there on, the, on these two zone trips we went to L.A., it was like literally we would go anywhere that any one person came up with. There, was no, there were no rules. There was no preset agenda. And so the, the feeling, the essence, although it was Los Angeles and some people were quite familiar with it, it was a genuinely an alien landscape, a psychic alien landscape. Mm -hmm. I can't even describe it. And I, th I feel like we were all in a different, I felt like I was in a different mindset at the time I was there. Mm -hmm. I had always wanted to climb the Hollywood letters. I like to climb things. And so we just went there and climbed them. You know, it's Lance Alexander. Um, Another cacophony founder. Yeah. Um, uh, and this is the uh, this is the um, zine that Carrie put together for. Yeah, I the zone this trip. is for the fir the first zone trip. I, I tend to be a zine maker. I still do. So I would always do zines for sh for events. So go yeah. ahead. So go um, ahead. moving along, Sanarchy is that that's one thing that Cacophony started that we have very mixed feelings about. Um, it was actually originally the original idea was in the Suicide Club, and Gary Warren had run across uh, an article in. Uh, Mother Jones magazine of all places about a, about a, uh, a, a Dutch group called Solvognon that did a political Santa Claus protest in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, where they went in with 40 Santas into the biggest department store around Christmas time and started uh, giving, or they started giving uh, all presents and stuff off the shelves to the kids and saying, here, Santa in the store wants you to have this. And they wouldn't stop. They were pretty radical. And so the cops came in, tried to get them stopped. They wouldn't stop. So the cops started beating them up and taking the gifts away from the children. <laughs> so all those kids who are now in their 40s, they've never forgotten that ever in their entire lives. <laughs> so Gary thought this was an interesting event and wanted to do something to kind of replicate it. It never ended up happening like so many ideas in the Suicide Club. We were so replete with crazy ideas already, we didn't get a chance to do everything that we wanted to, and that was one thing. It was later reprised by Santa Rob in the Cacophony Society, came up with the idea, and then we ended up doing it in 1994 in San Francisco, and it ended up in, you know, crime and disillusion and, you know, horror, you know, bad Santas and, you know, the whole thing. So, uh, um, 
Of course, there was joy as well. Um, this was in New York in 1998 on the first New York SantaCon. And uh, this is where he met, this is for my, for my German PowerPoint uh, when I was in Berlin. <laughs> so, uh, this is uh, uh, Chuck Palahniuk, uh, who wrote Fight Club based on, partially on the Suicide Club and Cacophony Society. Mostly on Cacophony because he was a member of Portland Cacophony. You know, that Project Mayhem, that was based Pro on Cacophony. Project Mayhem and Fight Club, yeah, was yeah. based on Cacophony. And uh, one of Kevin's wonderful, uh, you know, um, factoids Actoids. about that. Yeah. Uh, now, I don't know if, if Carrie wants to talk about 1907 or if P. Siegel wants to talk about 1907. You're certainly welcome to. If, you, if not, we can wax poetic about it. But if you want to say anything, P. Um, Just that I lived there for uh, almost exactly 20 years. And uh, I had more fun in that place than I've had in all the rest of my life put together. Uh, where um, the Cacophony Society... Mm -hmm. Spent a lot of time hanging out around the kitchen table. Yeah. And uh, I started an event for Cacophony called um, the Marcel Proust Support Group, where I got a bunch of people to read Proust together. And it turned into a zine called. <laughs> oh. It turned into a zine called Proust Said That. It's not. It's done. recording. It's not a television speaker. Being recorded. Now we can't see the slide. Is it still there? Just for the record, P. Siegel also developed decompression. Is that right? Thank you, yes. Yes. If I may, uh, if I may make an historical content. Yeah, I am. <laughs> if I may make an historical content, this uh, multi story flat, which was as you can see, it's basically Edwardian in style, which means it was built somewhere around just before, just after the 1906 earthquake, was originally for well-off people and had even had servants' rooms on the top floor. By the time P had moved in, it had been the domain of, all three stories of it had been the domain of a welfare mother who was going around to different welfare uh, departments in San Francisco collecting welfare checks for something over 20 different kids all of who lived in rooms inside this place. If you went inside to visit the place, you looked at all the doorways and scratched your head because the things you noticed were, first of all, there were all the drill holes from all the locks and hasps on each separate door. And obviously nobody trusted anybody else in that building in those days. And the second thing, you couldn't but help but notice the bullet holes. <laughs> Then Miss P moved in, took it over, and turned it into a uh, an oasis. <laughs> right. So when P when P moved into the building, then eventually it ended up being twenty dysfunctional artists living in there who she was taking care of. <laughs> so that's that's the building where the Burning Man event was uh, plotted. Almost in I'd say probably fifty percent, eighty percent of the planning for that event what took place. What years were you in there from? Uh, I moved in in 1984. I moved in there Halloween in 1984. And we started hanging out there about 88, I'd say. Yeah. About 88. And then Burning Man was being planned there in 89, 90. Um, uh, here's another one, the Salmon Run. Another uh, cacophony event that... Uh, it's still going on. Still going on, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, once again, this is another idea that uh, Santa Rob came up with, so don't be too mad at him for SantaCon. Um, this, is just, this is exactly what it looks like. And that is, that, that's the, those are the salmon running against the tide at the Beta Breakers in San Francisco. So, uh, Oh yeah, yeah. The, sal the salmon's would r salmon's would run into the shark runners who were going in the opposite direction, and there was always blood. Uh, the costumes were designed and made by Anne Coulter. Uh, yeah, costumes designed by Annie Coulter. Uh, this is another uh, cacophony event. Um, the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, 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 they were getting up to close to a thousand jumpers, and uh, um, anyway, we ran out to the middle of the bridge with several people, and uh, and uh, a baby and attempted to be the thousandth jumper off the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, 
And uh, so, Suicide Club um, and Cacophony were, were both, I mean, sewer, sewer walks were pretty common in both, I would say. And, uh, and uh, here's the later Cacophony Society sewer walk. Jason Rackerby and uh, Louise Darmilowitz yes. once again. Looking sharp, yeah. please. Um, this is the zone trips we're talking about. Okay, Carrie invented this concept of the zone trip after reading the, watching these uh, you know, Russian films and reading Russian novelists. And uh, so the zone trip number four was the first trip to the Black Rock Desert with the Burning Man. And uh, Can I make one quick Oh, please, action? absolutely. There's one other influence on the zone trip. If any of you have re not read it, I highly recommend it. It's a book called Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. Mm -hmm. So that's as much about the zone as anything else I've ever read. So Who's it by? Pynchon. So, uh, and this is, you know, we're not going to talk too much about Burning Man, but a little bit. Um, the first few years out in the desert were basically a, a cacophony zone trip. Um, and uh, here's some different shots from, uh, oh, this is a rough draft with the uh, first write-up. Bad day, uh, at, bad Black day Rock. at Black Rock. Zone trip number four, which you can't really read there, but um, uh, this is raising the cacophony flag uh, on the edge of the playa at the 11-mile turnoff, 1990. Crossing the line. Crossing the line. Dean Gustafson and Bobby Gelman in 1991, the second year at Burning Man, when they were the they were the drummers. There were no uh, there were no uh, uh, kind of poor poorly uh, rhythm, rhythmically challenged white guy bongo players that year. Um, they had a couple of really good uh, jazz and rock and roll drummers. Um, Dean was first in 1990. What's that? Dean was first. Dean was the first drummer. Uh, that's correct in 1990, and the last one on Baker Beach as well. Um, Steve Mobia and Dave Warren uh, at the first year, first year on the Black Rock Desert. Um, David left us some years ago, and uh, I remember David. So many stories about David Warren. He ran the giant camera out on uh, out at uh, the Cliff House. He and Chris De Monterey rescued it from oblivion and restored it. Ran it for many, many years. Um, I remember when I, I I came to the Suicide Club. David was 42 years old. I was 18, and I thought, my God, this guy. Who's this ancient guy? I mean, he might as well have been 90 years old, right? I couldn't believe that I was hanging out with somebody who's 42 years old. It was really annoying. And uh, I remember one time he gave me, I was, I was taking off on a hitchhiking trip around the country, and he gave me a giant rubber thumb. He said, hey, kid, you'll need this. Uh, that was Dave Warren. Um, and he was the spirit of chaos for the Suicide Club. We're going to talk a little bit about the Billboard Liberation Front, which is a group that started in the Suicide Club. Gary Warren and Adrian Burke did a Suicide Club event uh, altering a billboard that then kind of morphed into the Billboard Liberation Front when Dave Warren and, and I, with the help of Jason Wechter and Bill Costura and Steve Mobia and Bob Campbell and uh, Nell and, and, uh, and Benjamin Friedman, a bunch of other people did the first billboard hits. Jason Wechter, although he would deny it now. Um, pretty simple <laughs> to change a billboard and change the... Right, Dimitri and Saffron, uh, Jesse Orski were, were there as well. Pretty easy to change a billboard sometimes. Uh, more difficult other times. Yeah. This is the previous one. What was the what? Go back. This yeah. one here. LSD. They turned off all the other. We turn. Yeah. These three letters here and these three letters there were judged to be extraneous. <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway, it's that simple. Uh, this is a little bit more elaborate, Am I Dead Yet, with a six-foot uh, neon skull over Joe Camel's head. They, you know, they really missed a ticket with Joe Camel. They should have done a Saturday morning children's cartoon with Joe Camel. It would have got more smokers. Um, Golden Gate Bridge Center. The Golden Gate Bridge and the Bay Bridge were big things for the Suicide Club and later Cacophony. Um, uh, anybody, the idea with the Suicide Club and Cacophony is anybody could do an event. Anyone could do an event. And uh, Catherine Baker in the Suicide Club had never really organized anything with a bunch of people before, but it was, uh, it was her, um, birthday. her birthday in 1977, and she thought, well, I, I want to do something special for my birthday, and why don't we have a big potluck dinner with everybody on the pedestrian walkway of the Golden Gate Bridge? So we did. We went there. And then uh, th that was an ongoing event for 26 years. Every year we went there until uh, the Bridge District finally figured out that we were coming there mm -hmm. and cut us off. This is from, I don't know, what year, 87, 88, maybe, 89. 89. Um, 
It would. It was definitely the '80s. I had the asymmetrical haircut. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, this is the group on the on the Golden Gate Bridge. So the idea is anybody, you know, this is what we like to pass along. That's why we wrote this book. It's kind of a how-to manual. Anybody can do these events. I mean, some of the stuff you know we got into later was a little bit more elaborate, more difficult, and uh, you know you take, you'd have to work up to it. But you don't have to. You know, just doing a billboard. I mean, you can go with a crayon. You can go on a subway or a bus and change whatever the, whatever the message says. It's not it's not rocket science. So, and the idea was like non-commercial you know, uh, uh, communing and, and non-commercial creation of events with, uh, with other people of like mind. We climb the Golden Gate Bridge a lot. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I'd like to point out here, Bill Costura, Mark Northcross, and Jean Mashovsky climbing the pipe, um, a formidable woman, um, and one of the co-founders co co of the Cacophony Society. Is that inside the tower? No, that is outside the tower. If she let go of that, she would fall into that plate metal below and then bounce off of it and fall 150, 200 feet to the, to the concrete stanchion below. Under the roadway, that's correct. Um, Golden Gate Bridge uh, with uh, John Gilmore, Joe Weinstein, and I don't know who all else on the top many, many years ago. Fuzzy photo. We, we weren't really into recording things that much <laughs> in the Suicide Club, um, more into doing them. Um, little Billboard Liberation Front. Um, one of Kevin's factoids for that. Um, and this is kind of a break in between this and the Suicide Club stuff. So you want to go over anything with Cacophony or anything no, you want to touch I, on? I or any questions about... Anybody have anything to offer? Or you, you'll be tested later, so we'll see your notes. What was, what was yeah, the, Kathy Kepman. I did an event one time uh, that most of Emily Dickinson's poetry can be sung to the tune of The Yellow Rose of Texas. So people brought their Emily Dickinson poems, and we sang them to the tune of the Yellow Rose of Texas. Mm -hmm. Cacophony or Cacophony. Cacophony. Yeah. What was the name of that coffee shop? It was, uh, it's still there. It's out on Balboa. On Balboa, yeah. the 36th. Yeah, Simple the, uh, Pleasures? Yeah, the uh, at, at Stone Bay Hotel. Yeah. Simple yeah. Pleasures. Simple Pleasures. Oh, yeah. And I'm here to tell you that Simple Pleasures has never had anything as fun or as good except that night when Kathy let us all in uh, doing all that. Um, yeah, I actually, no, I, I got no the... I idea Emily Dickinson could be that much fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and also the Charles Brook House. Oh, so yeah. Well, that was one thing about Cacophony that I think it depended on the people, but I think um, there was so much literary um, influence, influence yeah. like the Marcel Proust support group, the Bukowski support group. I was heavily influenced by tons of literature. You know, we did those poetry breakfasts all the time, and, you know, all of that was part of it. At least I got a lot of my source material from that, and it sounds like a lot of other people did too. Yeah. You had the um, D Dorothy Parker. Oh my God. <laughs> what was that? The. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, that was a good event, Peter. That was a good literary well, it, it, event. You did it on a regular basis. I decided. I decided in And one of the expressions of that tendency was when I decided I had to have my own book club, because that's what everybody else was doing. Uh, but I couldn't quite get myself around to quite taking myself as seriously as I wanted to about it, so I named it Dorothy Parker's Perpetual Perambulating Pedagogic Paperback Powwow. Powwow. That's what it was. Wow. Look at the gold star just for remembering that. We had our... Right here. We, we had our we had our first meeting we had our first meeting in that wonderful Chinese restaurant the Hong Kong restaurant on Church Street um, where like God twenty or thirty people showed up and then after that it sort of perambulated from house to house Kathy is it still going on no, no yeah anyway we had a lot of we had we had a lot of fun uh, we had a lot of fun insulting each other's literary taste over the years. <laughs> Another literary event that we did that was a Phil Buley idea, again, once again, for, to bring up Phil, um, was the suicide note writing workshop. <laughs> Where you were to bring suicide notes, your favorite suicide notes, but you weren't allowed to bring guns or knives. <laughs> so, right. And the whole point of the workshop was to write your own suicide note and then carry it with you for the rest mm -hmm. of your life. So. Leave them guessing, I think, was the point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Do you, uh, do you still have the official booklet, The Art and Science of Billboard Improvement? Good question. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, uh, that's online. You can find that online on the billboard, uh, billboardliberation.com. And uh, we do have a bunch of the pamphlets left. There, yeah, there are five different editions of it that I know of. Uh, and various anarchist bookstores carried them at different periods of time. But yeah, it's a how-to manual on how to improve billboards that we wrote uh, back in the mid '80s, late '80s. Um, so that was that question. Um, Hate Street hey. near Masonic has copies still. Okay. Bound together books on Hate Street. Three dollars. It's a it's a real bargain. Yeah. So um Did you have something, Peter? 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 Yeah. I'd like to share an anecdote to illustrate what was intentionally a more serious aspect of the Suicide Club, although I think it had farther reaching serious ramifications than anybody ever really dreamed of at the time. Uh, and I can do it either, leave it up to you two, I can do it either through the, bill, through the first Billboard Liberation Front night, or I can do it through the night that you and I scouted out the Golden Gate Bridge, John. Which one? The Golden Gate Bridge, that's a good story. Okay. So, John, I'm, I'm a recovering control freak, in case you couldn't already recovering. tell from seeing me on, up on stage. Recovering. So, and the first time John Law, who is a non-recovering control freak. <laughs> the first time John and I ever set eyes on each other uh, was in Gary's bookstore. And you know those situations in which you walk into a room and because two people of similar character who are never ever gonna like each other because it's like holding, they're like holding up mirrors in front of each other's faces? It was one of those. Yeah. And it took John and I a long, long time to warm up to each other. John, <laughs> John was, uh, give, and to his credit, John was the one who made the move. And what he did was he walked up to me one evening and said, quite belligerently, so Field, are you gonna, are you gonna, are you gonna scout out the Golden Gate Bridge with me tonight or what? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him and I've always loved adventures and exploring, but, I've always, but John is much less physically challenged than I am. And I looked at him straight in the eye and said, of course. <laughs> so, what was ostensibly the two of us uh, going down to the Golden Gate Bridge to explore it for, uh, to, cli to lead a bunch of uh, suicide clubbers up the thing in an, in an event, uh, but was in reality John sort of halfway leading me along. We went down underneath the thing, figured out how to climb up into the thing, and spent the night climbing around the damn thing. I, for me, it was the, up until that time in my life, it was the most terrifying thing I had ever done in my entire existence. And uh, we went up and down this thing, sideways, downways. Blah, 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 blah. By the time we were finishing and gotten back down off the thing and on the ground, I had to sit. How long did I keep us sitting there as, until I recovered myself so I could I actually walk again? <laughs> took me about 10 minutes. And what the, the Suicide Club did that for quite a lot of people by it expanded our boundaries in terms of what we were willing to risk doing in ways that I think affected a lot of us in ways that are, we're still figuring out today. For what it's I worth, I share that. Sorry. Um, with uh, the name Phil Bewley has come up a few times <clears throat> and because he's no longer with us, I just wanted to say for this record, one of my all-time favorite events was Phil's clown event. There's a, there used to be this hamburger joint in North Beach called Clown Alley. So it was Phil's idea that we would all dress up like clowns and go in, you know, one or two at a time and sit at different tables. And Phil had this gorgeous satin, perfect uh, clown outfit with perfect makeup and he had this cigarette dangling from the corner of his mouth like he had just had a hard day at the circus and was you know, just wanted a beer and a burger and there was like a, a two dozen of us and passers-by kept stopping and looking in the windows and pointing and the employees were cracking up and and afterwards we went to the lusty lady the famous um, strip joint in North Beach and collective, yes. And um, there were like 12 of us crowded into one of those little booths with a pretty girl. And then there was the, the bigger dance room that had 
window shades, and you put money in the th in the thing, and the window shade would go up, and you could see the dancing girls, and we could see them pointing at the windows and say, "Look, there's more clowns." We couldn't hear them, but we could t tell what they were saying, and it was um, one of my all-time favorite events. To me, it sort of epitomizes the co uh, cacophony, and Phil was brilliant, and we all miss him. Yeah, that was what, what, what Peter and and and, uh, and what Peter and Peter were both saying is very true, and that's what that was a genius of the Suicide Club, and I think of uh, Gary and Adrian and and the other folks who put that together was they figured out a way that they could get a group of people together to work collaboratively to challenge their fears and do stuff that they would not do by them by themselves, and everyone was encouraged to do events based on whatever ideas or fantasies that they had, and it was a really it was a it was a really brilliant, simple but very brilliant kind of. Uh, uh, con context that they would put people in, and uh, I'd encourage that a lot. And uh, so, uh, you know, I don't know. Any other questions about cacophony, uh, Peter? Well, the clowns on the buses, yeah. So oh, here's yeah. a bunch of people dressed as clowns in rush hour San Francisco at 7 in the morning scattered up and down uh, the Richmond Gary. District on yeah. Gary, each of them waiting to get on a bus dressed in, uh, dressed in the style of somebody going to work but as a clown. <laughs> and the idea was that the first clown was going to get on, get, get, uh, get on the bus at, uh, at the uh, bus end at Bal Balboa and uh, the ocean. And then as the bus went along, it would pick up these individual clowns as the bus stops went on. This was great idea in theory. <laughs> Unfortunately, what the bus, the organizer of the event got so nervous that they forgot to check the destination sign on the bus and didn't realize they were getting on an express bus. <laughs> <laughs> and so what happened was, and I realized I know this, was I was dressed as a clown with my friend and 25th Avenue and waiting for the bus. He was and I'm sorry, on 33rd <laughs> Avenue. And uh, the, uh, what happened was that the bus would go flying on by each bus stop with the clowns waiting on the bus stop, seeing the clowns already in it, and thinking something had gone round, the clowns would suddenly start running after the bus. <laughs> and so by the time they hit 25th Avenue, there was this huge crowd of clowns running down Gary Street to the bus, trying to catch up to the damn thing. So finally at 25th Avenue, instead of this carefully staged and stage managed one at a time bus to make the other yeah, bus riders scratch their heads and think what the hell is going on here instead here was this crowd of sweaty disheveled <laughs> exhausted <laughs> trying to catch their breaths clowns gasping their way onto the bus with everybody looking and saying oh san francisco yeah. who cares <laughs> so so we're going to go we, we're going to go so we don't keep you here all night we're going to go into the suicide club portion of this little thing Suicide Club, Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, if you have questions or comments or epithets, please feel free. Um, Stevenson wrote, you know, many books. Uh, adventure books, Kidnapped, Treasure Island. Suicide Club is about a group of men who put their worldly affairs in order to live each day as though it were their last. Drew, uh, drew uh, uh, um, uh, str not straws, but there was a process by which one of them was chosen to be assassinated by one of the others and no one knew. Um, Gary Warren at the Circus of Soul bookstore, uh, four, uh, 411, I think, uh, Judah at 10th. Um, David Warren, who was the spirit of chaos for the, uh, the, the Suicide Club. David and Gary met. They're, you couldn't find two people who were more different. Um, Gary was very lo logical, very uh, controlled, very believed in agreements and being on time. He's always on time. He's the first person I ever met that every moment of his day was incrementally scheduled, and he made all the schedules almost always on time. David was <laughs> a complete, one of the most chaotic human beings I've ever known, and the spirit of chaos in a real sense. And uh, we were talking about the giant camera earlier, which David uh, 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 got and restored with Chris DeMonterey, who's in the back, back, back of the room right here. He just showed up a little while ago. And uh, so David's spirit of chaos and, and onward going forward thinking and just line of baloney and talking people into doing whatever he wanted to talk them into. And Chris's steadfast uh, you know, nature and actually making things happen 
uh, allowed the, the giant camera to be restored, and it's probably the reason it's still here today. Um, Yeah. Oh, I will. I get. Yep. Well, David could drink an entire gallon of vodka a day and still appear to be completely sober. Oh yeah, me too. Many times. And uh, and David was one of the founders of the Suicide Club. He was pretty good at. It. He was pretty good at conning. Yeah. So David, uh, Gary met him because Gary collected people, and he heard about David and saw articles about him doing things like going down, dressed up as a, as a Salvation Army dude with a pot full of money to give it away. Now, he, didn't, he wasn't a rich guy, okay? He just thought it was a funny idea. Um, Community University, which I want to touch on, Community University was a free school, part of the free university movement of the 60s, which was inspired by and started in uh, 1964 when the free speech movement got rolling. And by 1965, SF State had a free university. Uh, um, and I forget the name of it right now, but it lasted for about five years. And then uh, many universities around the country had free universities. The idea was that educators would put this out there where students could have a free school. It would engage students in a way that might get them interested in education during a very, you know, like a, a period of upheaval and, uh, and anguish in education. And so uh, Community University started in 1970. It was an adjunct of SF State. They had a little trailer on the San Francisco State campus, and they had a stipend, and they had uh, student uh, uh, administrators. Gary Warren came on the scene about 73 and became the student administrator for a uh, university and there were a bunch of free classes and uh, maybe 100, 150 and there were maybe 1,500 people on their mailing list and uh, they kept doing weirder and weirder classes. I mean in addition to the conversational French and uh, theoretical physics and VW repair and how to make tofu, they would do things like pie throwing classes. They do uh, uh, you know, like weird underground, like uh, uh, midnight walks on the, on the beach and things like that. They also did parodies. Death School was a parody of uh, the kind of the Bay Area, new, a new agey kind of life school kind of thing where everybody's hugging everybody else all the time. So there's a good deal of sardonic humor in the Suicide Club while embracing some of the 60s, uh, better elements of the 60s, like the ideas of free. Diggers were a big influence on, on, on us, uh, an influence on some of the people in the group and the idea of uh, giving away free food. And diggers, of course, had their problems, but the basic ideas were sound. And um, Community University, this is uh, the one on the left, the Community University calendar on the left is the first time the Suicide Club was mentioned in, uh, in print, and it says charter membership in the San Francisco Suicide Club. It was listed as a class in a free school, uh, and then quickly became a secret society. Um, this is uh, Deb Palfus and uh, Peter Field, and I rigged... Uh, uh, a traverse at the old Harkness Hospital across from the DMV at the end of Panhandle Park. And we just made it, you know, that was a photo for the uh, cover of the Community University calendar. Um, we could just make up whatever we wanted to make up. I mean, a lot of fun. I mean, there were a lot of different inter interrelated groups. Briar Patch was a small business group in San Francisco that kind of came out of the hippie movement. But there, there was a lot of crossover with the Community University and, and the Suicide Club. Um, it was a bunch of small business people who would barter their services and goods rather than pay taxes and spend money. It lasted for some time. The idea was, it was a good idea, but like so many things that are free, I mean, it can last only so long in our society. Um, the uh, uh, um, uh, New Games Foundation, which was a, started by kind of like a little idea that Stuart Brand had, and then he kind of walked away from it, and a bunch of people took it over, a really good group of people took it over, and did uh, New Games Foundation for 15 years, traveled all around the world collecting weird stories, uh, weird games, and tribal games, uh, 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 national games and whatnot, and, and compiling them in this book, and they would teach these games around the country as a, a nonprofit educational institute. This started; their offices were in the Inner Sunset and the Hate. Um, uh, the garage sale. The way we raised money for Community University was we had a giant garage sale. Everybody would donate all their stuff every three times a year. We'd have this giant ass garage sale, and uh, and. Um, you could pay anything you wanted to for the, the stuff in the garage sale, anything. So what would happen is like for every dick who would come in and give you like 50 cents for a stereo that was worth 20 bucks, which would be like 100 bucks now, uh, you'd have 50 people who'd give you like a buck or two for something that was of no value. So it kind of worked out. We made our roughly $700 every, every uh, three times a year, which is enough to put out the, cal the catalog of classes. Um, Suicide Club newsletter became the newsletter for obvious reasons. Uh, and it was uh, edited by somebody different every month. The idea was that a different person would edit it every month. I and did that one. Kathy, uh, uh, Kathy, <laughs> Kathy Kate, uh, did uh, the one on the right or the left? Well, the one on uh, uh, left. 
Okay, on the left. And, and so some of the, some of the uh, uh, newsletters would be well-designed and the graphs would be good. Others would be, uh, others would be not so well-designed. I didn't put a picture in them, of course. But uh, Don Heron did the logo uh, up, up above, the little uh, Suicide Club dead guy logo. Um, some of the events, uh, le on the left was the uh, 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 um, Union Square parking garage. We took over three parking <laughs> garage elevators, put different scenes in each elevator, including including a gorilla with four people bound and gagged hostage on the floor, waving around a toy gun, uh, an in, a, a, a spaghetti dinner scene with two young people sitting at a table uh, with a full spaghetti dinner and a guy playing violin and tails and top hat as they ate their dinner. So people would get ready to get in the elevator, and they'd see that, and they'd like, oh, wait for the next elevator, and then there's like a gorilla in that elevator. <laughs> so this was the kind of thing, ideas, ideas that people would come up with. The, the naked cable car, uh, which was Nancy Prussia, one of the founders of the group, Wanted just thought it'd be fun to get naked on a cable car, so we kind of plotted it out. Pardon? Well, if you, <laughs> that's, this is the seventies. Everybody got naked, whether you wanted them to or not. <laughs> so uh, you know, we did. There were about forty of us, and we got naked on a cable car. And uh, you know, the, 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 challenging your fears is a big part of Gary Warren's philosophy. And he liked for people to do events, and he tried to do events where he was challenging something that frightened him, or you know, maybe frightened somebody else. And uh, so like climbing the Golden Gate Bridge would be very frightening to most people, but most anybody in this room could have done it at one point because it's not that physically difficult for a person, a fit person, but you wouldn't know that until you do it, right? Once you've done it, it's like, oh, okay, that wasn't so scary. I did that. I climbed a ladder and, you know, it was a long ways. And if I'd let go, I would have fallen, but I, it was kind of cool. I did it. For me, getting naked on a cable car was the scariest thing I ever did in my life because I was raised middle class and you just don't get naked in public. It's just something you don't do. And it busted some wires in my head when we did that. And after that, I was like, oh, okay. Nobody gives a shit if I'm naked in public. You know, what's the worst thing that could happen, right? Be worst thing that could happen in all 40 of us. And, and they're not going to arrest, yeah, and they wouldn't arrest all 40 people either. So we did the naked cable car. Yeah, that's Peter, that's Peter Field. That's Peter Field. And there he is in the front. With, that's Peter Field right in front of the hat. Um, and, you know, we just took over the middle of the street. Um, food fights were a big thing. Uh, Pierre Barral was uh, getting kicked out of his uh, rental, uh, ha rented house in Glen Park. And uh, his landlord was a total, was a real asshole. And so Pierre thought, well, let's have a food fight in my house before I leave. So he invited the Suicide Club into his house, and we had a giant food fight. Steve Mobia in the middle there, Pierre Burrell in the back, uh, Adrian Burke right over here, um, uh, Golden Gate Park, and the Suicide Club started in 1977, which is 10 years to the date after the uh, Summer of Love, right? So w when I showed up in San Francisco in 19, uh, 1976, everybody told me the party was over. Like, yeah, the party's over, kid. You might as well go home. It was eight, nine years ago. <laughs> I never listened to hippies since then. But uh, so uh, Kathy Hardy had an idea to do a 10-year anniversary of the Summer of Love, which is kind of a parody, but also an homage. And so the Suicide Club got dressed up like hippies and went around the hate. Uh, they ran into photographer Greg Mancuso, who shot them as though they were genuine hippie re re revisionists and put it in High Times magazine. Um, uh, another, we climbed stuff. Uh, Peter Field over here on the left, that is Peter Field rappelling off of Harkness Hospital. Bob Campbell in the parking lot off of 7th Avenue. Um, oh, more hippies. Um, more hippies. Uh, more hippies. Okay. Uh, Roxy Theater, one of the only events the Suicide Club did that was an above-ground event that was advertised. We showed Gary Warren had, a, had an event there showing two movies. He called it uh, Tribute to Paranoia. We showed the movie 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T in another movie called to Catch His Catch Can, about an Italian film about a guy who uh, every animal in the entire world is trying to kill him. So it's like the ultimate paranoid movie. I can't, you have to see it. It's to see it, believe it, to believe it. Uh, Vittorio Gassman was a star. Oh, on the left, oh, this is an important event. This was uh, in the Follies Theater, which is now known of as the Victoria Theater. And Carla Wood, bless her, bless her, she wanted to do an event for the Suicide Club, but she didn't, she was like, oh, I don't know how to climb bridges or go into sewers or whatever, but I'd like to do a burlesque show because um, she was, had been a burlesque dancer. In her, in, her, in her earlier years, and she used to perform in the Follies Theater. Steve, please feel free to correct me with any, with any, uh, if she you had. She was still a burlesque dancer, okay. Anyway, Carla was a burlesque dancer, and she wanted to do a show with her friends and people that she liked, 
rather than creepy guys with their hats in their laps. So she got together with Steve uh, and uh, Pierre Baral and uh, who was the guy who ran uh, Bruce, Bruce Collins and some other folks, and, uh, and, and, and they figured out how to sneak into the Follies Theater, Victoria Theater now. You may have been to it down on 16th and Cap. And uh, she organized this giant event with all of her stripper friends and performer friends, and uh, so we snuck 100 people into this abandoned theater for, a, for an abandoned burlesque. And it was Carla, she just, I just wanted to do an event. And the Suicide Club came together and helped her figure out how to organize it. She produced it, and we, and we did this event in an abandoned theater. Uh, wonderful. Uh, I've never forgotten it. There, we didn't record a lot of stuff in the Suicide Club. We did not record it as though it were art. We did not self-consciously record it uh, you know, for, to sell anything or pitch anything. So there are a lot of events there were no photos for. Some events, they're like little Polaroid snapshots, and that's it. Um, uh, Decoy Street, wonderful event where Steve Mobia, uh, living on Minna Alley, had, was walking across the street, noticed a prostitute bleeding on the street, went over to help the prostitute, realized that the prostitute's wound was a plastic fake wound, and the, it wasn't indeed a prostitute. Uh, no, it was a, no, it wasn't a prostitute. It was a, 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 a drunk guy on the street, yeah, right? A drunk guy. The prostitute was... Right, and, oh, and a prostitute came up. That's right. A prostitute came up and flashed a badge right. and said, get the fuck out of here. We're, we're undercover cops. Right, right. And so he did an event called Decoy Street based on this. I, on this this thing that happened to him, where we took over uh, uh, we took over O'Farrell Street between Powell and Mason, which at that time was a complete, you know, drug riddled prostitute, a very dangerous corner, and uh, we were all dressed up as different decoys. And uh, here's Robin Craybill right here, uh, our host tonight, um, uh, carrying he's a decoy drug addict carrying a giant <laughs> syringe. <laughs> so. Uh, Right. Yeah, that was a decoy bum lying in a gutter with a radio and a bag. And I remember I was talking to Peter Field, who was a decoy businessman in a three-piece suit and a radio and a, pl and a paper bag. Anyway, so you can come up with... Decoy, decoy, yeah. P Peter's favorite was a decoy, decoy. Uh, and Steve Mobia, was it I recall, he was a decoy molested MC nightclub manager or something like that. Um, Don Heron was an uh, or, or original early member of the Suicide Club, and like so many people in this group, he, was, he had certain interests, but he never really shared them with other people, and he was a big fan of mystery fiction. So in the Suicide Club, he was encouraged by other people to start doing events, so he did these elaborate detective games. He ended up doing these kind of not so elaborate, then they became elaborate detective games, which then also grew out of his interest uh, in the writings of Dashiell Hammett. And he started doing the Dashiell Hammett walking tour in the, uh, in the Tenderloin uh, downtown area in 1977. And today it's the longest lived literary walking tour in America. He's been covered by every media outlet you can think of. Um, Peter Field, who's here, also works for, uh, with the, uh, the, uh, the library and does, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, City Guides and does Tenderloin. He's probably one of the most knowledgeable people in the country about the Tenderloin neighborhood in San Francisco and does hi uh, historical tours of the Tenderloin. So people grew into their interests and were able to share them with other people, were encouraged and emboldened to really become more themselves through this group. I certainly did. Many people that I know did. Louise Jarmilowitz, who was just a natural costumer, ended up becoming a professional costumer over time, doing costumes for the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, the opera and whatnot. People were encouraged to do this. Bill Costura, who's not here, he, he's not here, but he... Uh, he was an unemployed dishwasher when I met him and a science fiction fan. We were sneaking into abandoned buildings, and he liked abandoned buildings. He started studying them. He became an expert on abandoned buildings, started writing books about them. Frank Jordan appointed him to the Landmarks Board in San Francisco, and he became the, he became the historian for Caltrans. You know, go figure. Because he was sneaking into abandoned buildings. So this is why this stuff's so important. Because you don't have to be, anybody could do this, basically. You just need a bunch of other people who are dumb enough to go with you, you know, and, and have their own crazy ideas. Um, Band of Buildings, you know, once again, uh, uh, I don't see uh, uh, Bill Castillo right here. Um, Isn't that yeah. when everyone got arrested? Uh, no, that was the same building that we got arrested in. The, you're talking about the, the federal building 42, where 42 of us were arrested in formal wear in a, on the 20th floor of an abandoned skyscraper, but that's another story. <laughs> Whose idea was this event, John? Oh, the, 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 um... the, uh, the exploring the building. Yeah, over, uh, over on Fell Street. Chris and I lived at 7th and, on oh, Chris, yeah. And, and, yeah, 7th and Stevenson. Yeah, Allen. we always saw that building. Right. You know, uh, down 
Well, it was a 20-story skyscraper styled after the uh, Empire, Empire uh, State Building, and we used it for uh, all kinds of events. We would rappel off, we would rappel off the roof, practice rappelling on the side of the building. Uh, like I say, Steve and I organized an event in it. And then the, uh, uh, what do we call it? We call it the Federal Building 42 or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, 42 of us were arrested in this building. Um, be, well, that's a long story, but uh, so John, yeah. The first time we did this event, it was a lot of fun. And one of the things the organizers did, by that time, the uh, old church had been walled off yeah. and turned into, and, and, and what remained of it turned into office space by dropping a false ceiling. Well, the office that was there happened to be the IRS. So the yeah. IRS people who knew about the old abandoned church above them in the back of the walls used to say to each other that people would go into the IRS offices to get religion. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. And, and, and then the Suicide Club rediscovered it in 1977. What you're looking at in that picture is the steps leading up to where the altar used to be. In the church and section of the building. There and you were looking up at the ceiling, there will all be rods hanging down from it was a very strange place. People may remember the George Coates' performance work, which was, was in the same space. Yeah, George Coates. So we're going to keep moving along because we don't have a lot of time. We don't, we don't have all night. So anyway, fair play for rabbits. I think we already went over that. Blindfold event on the bus. Everybody's blindfolded on a muni bus. Um, billboards. We already. This is the first. This is a suicide club billboard, not the Billboard Liberation Front. This is the billboard that inspired the Billboard Liberation Front. Um, and see, we, we, we voted on the caption. We we're on the roof of the building. We we're on the roof of the building with 26 people, and we voted on the caption. It took it about three hours. It was a really annoying process, and uh, everybody's arguing about what to change it to. And so the w one side, the bigger the bigger billboard on the one side was changed to this, which I thought was a very concrete and not a very interesting message. The one on the other side, which is a smaller billboard, was changed to this, which I preferred myself. Um, but. Uh, uh, of course, uh, there are a couple of other. I mean, we did press releases for the uh, Billboard Liberation Front. We immediately started getting press for it. And in this one, uh, uh, our spokesman, uh, Simon Wagstaff, there's a picture of him over there. Uh, I said the alterations were made by gluing letters. And at one point, I remember he told a journalist that there were 300 people in the Billboard Liberation Front. And we all worked in the advertising business. And they printed it, <laughs> which is, which you keep in mind if you're ever reading a news article. Uh, and then one of the things, uh, kind of a suicide club corollary, uh, hit Charles Colson, who's uh, Richard Nixon's hatchet man in the face of the pie during the pieing craze in the, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, this is the staff of the Guerrilla Grotto, which is a group, uh, which is a, an ancillary uh, uh, organization that came out of the suicide club that Gary Warren started. It was a storefront uh, over uh, right next to po uh, um, Polly High on uh, Frederick Street and uh, an uh, adult uh, um, uh, environment, uh, cafe, play, playground, weird museum. Um, you know, climbing bridges, Bill Costura once again, they're on the bridge, Mark Northcross. Um, Jason, uh, is Jason on that climb? I don't know if Jason was on that climb, maybe he was. No, Jason Rackerby's not, no, he wasn't around then. Uh, um, so, and this is a little bit later, this is a, a later Cacophony Society climb of the Ambassador Bridge in Detroit which is the only bridge, a major suspension bridge in the world with a giant neon sign on top of it. Not sure, this is in Gary Warren's bookstore, and I don't know, nobody will tell me what happened at this particular event. But I have no idea, Steve. <laughs> but uh, the things like that, it was the 70s, and things like this did happen, and whenever any 20, 30-year-old people get a little snotty or anything, I just tell them, yeah, the 70s, you heard about them, everything you heard was true. John, 30 <laughs> seconds. The bookstore. That was the day oh, when you filled up the bookstore with Crisco-coated balloons so that you could only <laughs> walk around by popping balloons, and you had to take your clothes off in the anteroom room before going. Ah, it's better if we don't know what it was. <laughs> so, like I say, it was the 70s, um, uh, some of the in inspirations for what we're doing, I put in a couple of slides and then we got some more cacophony stuff if, if people want to keep going. We're inspired by the Surrealists and the Dadaists. Um, Surrealists and Dadaists were big ins inspiration to, to Gary Warren and some of the other folks. Um, cacophony, later cacophony event that Dean Gustafson did, predating Banksy by about 20 years, going into the MoMA and, uh, and uh, going from uh, fire uh, extinguishers to toilets to whatnot as though they were art objects. Out of poetry readings, Kathy Kay says, and uh, pre like I say, predating banks. Hey, we're being ahead of your time is a curse. There were guides. Some of us were guides taking people around and talking about it. At the at the MoMA at the MoMA, yeah. Yes, 
So since we didn't call it art, I guess. <laughs> um, the Diggers were, uh, yeah, I think a pretty good influence on the Suicide Club, the idea of things being free. You know, we didn't charge for Suicide Club events. We charged enough money to pay for whatever the expenses might have been, theoretically. Usually, like, uh, it'd be 50 cents or a quarter for gas or whatever. Um, we were he a bit heavily inspired, both in Cacophony and the Suicide Club, by Pulp Fiction, by Weird Movies, by... Uh, Dice Man was a big, very influential book in the Suicide Club. It's a wonderful book. I suggest you read it. Um, it's about taking each and every important decision you have to make in your life and throwing the dice, cho choosing like whatever 12 different potential things to do and literally doing the one. So it's like, should I, should I kill my partner? Should I fuck them? Should I just leave, walk out the door? Should I go get a burger? And literally doing it. And it's a really pretty, pretty interesting book. Uh, Pulp Fiction, Lovecraft was a giant influence on the Suicide Club. Uh, action and Victorian action and adventure fiction, big influence on the Suicide Club. Hitchcock, huge influence on the Suicide Club. I remember one weekend in the first month or two of the Suicide Club, we had done, we'd gone to the, the letters of the city of South San Francisco to slide down them on pieces of cardboard, these giant concrete letters. We'd gone on a sewer, we'd gone like a, in, 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 on a sewer tunnel walk, we, and we ended up uh, climbing around on the underside of the Golden Gate Bridge. And I remember at one point looking over at the, just the imagery at night, and, and it just seemed to me that I was in this movie, there's a scene where uh, Cary, uh, Cary Grant and Eve Marie Saint are hanging off the side of Mount Rushmore, just hanging on this wall, and just like a, I had this synesthesia between movie reality and real reality. And that was a part of what this stuff was. And when events really worked in the Cacophony or in the Suicide Club, that it clicked for, for me for, and for other people I know. Um, the Third Man, a uh, big influence on the sewer walks that we did. Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre Q. We went to, we, uh, Gary Warren had a 16 millimeter movie projector and we would rent movies from this little place down on Lusk Alley, 16 millimeter films, show the movie and then do an event based on the movie, plan these out ahead of time. We watched the Texas Chainsaw Massacres and went to sleep in a cemetery in Marin County. Um, uh, Meat Parade, this is a later, this is more cacophony stuff if you want to go on some more well, we cacophony stuff. About it. Yeah, we already kind of talked about cacophony. There's some, the Meat Parade in uh, Berkeley, uh, which you saw in the, in the film. Um, uh, Vanessa Coomerly, William Abernathy, um, people eating them animals, you know. This is in the middle of the day in the middle of a giant parade uh, with thousands of Berkeley families lining the streets. And uh, we were basically uh, uh, incinerating meat and throwing out chicken claws and GPC cigarettes going, here kid, first one's free. <laughs> I thought they were going to beat us up. It was Berkeley, right, the home of PC. I thought they were going to beat us up. They invited us back three years in a row. We were the most popular. <laughs> we were the most popular float in the entire parade. Um, you have to in Berkeley. You have to have your counter protesters. We had the vegetarians. You know, I hate crime. Uh, Dwayne Neutron uh, sitting back here in the round glasses came up with some of the most amazing and funny prank events in Cacophony. Uh, this was one. Uh, we protested the playing of the movie Fantasia. <laughs> and this made national news, including Time Magazine. <laughs> made international news, including Time Magazine, where it was uh, one of the main examples in the Time Magazine cover article about how California was filled with whiny identity politics. <laughs> and we were, sh we were held up as an example of, my God, they're protesting Fantasia for being politically incorrect. What are they going to do next in California? Thank you for that, by the way, Peter. That was one of the most brilliant things ever. Um, there you go. And people, you know, many people thought this was deadly serious. Yeah, Peter, right, right here. Dwayne Neutron, the spokesman for Spasm, Sensitive Parents Against Scary Movies. And I remember it was, it was made up of uh, several groups, Bad Rap, Bay Area Drought Relief Assistance Program, which was protesting the water-wasting segments in the Mickey Mouse Sorcerer's Apprentice sequence because we were in the middle of a drought. Uh, there was Massa, museums, uh, musicians against sappy arrangements, you know, who were protesting the Stokowski boulderization of the original classical pieces. Anyway, went on and on and on. R brilliant. The dieters. The, what was the one? One was the dieters, right? Oh, dieters, right, yeah. Protesting the hippo scene. Yeah, and the anatomically incorrect satyrs. They didn't have genitals. Right. So they're, every, we're protesting all that terrible stuff. Oh, we're getting kicked out of here very soon. How, 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 what do we got, Robin? How much time do we got? We're going to... We're going to push it as far as we can. How much time do we get? Okay. Uh, Bart Lounge, another Dwayne Neutron special, where uh, we got on Bart and, uh, and did a, a lounge act. I don't have any photographs for it, but um, um, also Let Them Eat Cake, 
which uh, was another Peter Doty, Dwayne Neutron, sp or Peter Doty special. Le, le, what was your name for that? Le, Pierre Le Marquis de Gato. Pierre Le Marquis de Gato. Um, and we would go out uh, with, the, uh, let, uh, with the Food Not Bombs folks who had been feeding poor people, and then we would give them these wonderful cakes, and then we'd deliver the crumbs to the mayor's office on a <laughs> silver tray yeah. as a kind of a political yeah. statement. Um, we also had a guillotine, and just for the record, Frank Jordan is the only mayor in San Francisco history to be beheaded twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and here's, here's Peter Doty and Vivian Perry um, in the city hall right after we delivered the crumbs to Mayor Jordan. Um, Urban I did a Rod start as a cacophony event, you know, running around uh, from bar to bar with, uh, I don't know, like that. Go figure. Soul train. Event in honor of Bart going to Colma. Oh, yeah. So, ah, uh, Soul Train going to Colma. <laughs> Urban Iditarod? Uh, you know, I only did, I never, I went on a couple of these, but I kind of just hung out for a little bit. I wasn't, wasn't really my event, but it was an awesome, fun event. Hundreds of people came on it different times. There was also like a golf. A, like a golfing event urban where people, golf. urban golf, where they golf through different urban locations. And people come up with any, see, the point is you, you come up with any idea, and all your crazy knucklehead friends would go, let's do it. And then you would go help them with their crazy idea. I mean, it's a pretty simple concept. It's how Burning Man got started. <laughs> um, uh, you know, this is the urban I did a ride running around, you know, Jesse Street. Chinese New Year's Treasure Hunt, uh, some of you may know that event, started as a suicide club event by Gary Warren, Rick Lasky, uh, and Adrian Burke worked on it. And then it went on, it was a yearly event. Uh, we, most of our events were not yearly. We didn't like to do events over and over again unless there was a reason for it. This was a wonderful one. It took place, Giant Treasure Hunt, in the middle of the Chinese New Year's parade. Uh, and then it, uh, years later, uh, Jason Wechter, who was in the suicide club, uh, started doing it and turned into a much larger charity event. Wonderful event, but quite different from the original event, which ended in a pie fight with about 100 people. Uh, Jason does it today, every year, at Chinese New Year's, and raises thousands of dollars for ch ch charity-based uh, 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 nonprofits. Um, cars were part of Cacophony. Here's the 504 PM special, most famous car in San Francisco for many years. Uh, giant wall fell on it in the Loma Prieta earthquake. Car hunt event that uh, I put together with Robert Burke and uh, People Hater, a wonderful group of very huggy guys. Um, uh, we put together our little car, remote controlled car, uh, with steel wheels, plate steel wheels made by Pepe Ozan, the wonderful artist Pepe Ozan. Um, there we are hunting this vehicle down on Blue Wing Playa, about 40 miles from the Black Rock, with live ammunition and a variety of uh, uh, weapons. Um, Chip Flynn of People Hater, one of the evil geniuses who uh, remote controlled this car so they could run it from a Futaba controller, same thing you'd run your little miniature car from. Uh, William Abernathy, who's great, one of his many great uh, pithy remarks was when asked if his gun was loaded, he said, it's just a stick if it's not loaded. Uh, that's me and Vanessa back in uh, 95, I guess it was. Um, Chris Radcliffe, who's a much better looking woman than he is a man. <laughs> and there's, there we are on the truck going about 40 miles an hour, uh, shooting at the car along the way. Pepe Ozan driving the chase vehicle. Um, Chris Radcliffe on the left shooting. Uh, there's 5,000 bullet holes-ish in the car. Licensed plate, legally uh, licensed and registered car hunt. That's, anyway, that's kind of it.